Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Social Concerns Committee presentation of A Refugee Story. This is a very timely presentation as the influx of Afghan refugees is about to be followed by an influx of Ukrainian refugees. And part of the, the mission of the Social Concerns Committee is education, and that is why we are so excited to bring you this program. Uh, before we move forward, just a reminder, if you do not want to be seen, please keep your video off and please mute yourself unless you are asking a question. Uh, thank you. And now I turn it over to um, uh, Nancy Moravec to go over procedures and to introduce our speaker. Nancy. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm so glad you're here. Um, we've been friends with Pete and Joyce Petersons for more than 40 years. Um, they were teachers to our children when they were at Agora High School. And um, we've uh, heard uh, Pete's story before, but um, I also have Pete's book that he wrote. And when we were, I don't know if you can see it or not. Um, there's some things about Pete that are very interesting. Pete not only is a teacher, but he also was a coach and he coached Olympic class athletes. He traveled the world with them. Um, in fact, his family for one year lived in Arabia while they were um, developing a, a track and field team in, there. He's a graduate of US, USC um, and uh, he lives in Agora Hills and quite near us. Uh, and uh, that's how we became friends through a mutual friend. A few months ago, I was on Facebook and I saw a posting that Pete had put up that was from his book. And it reminded, and it was coincidental because I had just said to our daughters, I wonder what Mr. Pete is thinking about what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, because in his book, he addresses a lot of the things that we're seeing right now that are happening in the Ukraine. And um, coincidentally, I saw his post on Facebook and in one of our Sunday school classes, I brought a, a Bible study. I don't know, I brought it up and Tim Bonds wrote me an email and said, I've talked to Kitty and we wondered if your friend might be willing to talk to us and tell us about his experience as a refugee um, and a person who had experienced the sa some similar experiences to what's happening right now in the Ukraine. And so I reached out to Pete and uh, he said, yes. Um, coincidentally also Joyce Peterson's is in our choir. She was there this morning singing. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of connections for a lot of people with Pete and Joyce. But what I wanted them to share, Pete to share with you and Joyce is gonna work, be with him doing that is what it's like to be a person who is a refugee a person who experiences what a lot of people are experiencing and we're seeing on the news today. And um, that's what Pete wrote about in his book among other things. So um, I don't want to take up any more of his time. Can you all see Pete and Joyce? Can you wave to them? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, what we're gonna ask you to do is if you don't wanna be on the screen, you don't have to be, but um, so you can block yourself if you want. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Joyce and Pete and um, allow them to share their story with you. So thank you for being here with us. Um, we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. And we appreciate you and your family taking so much time to make this possible, Pete and Joyce. And Marnie, who's in the background. All right, it's, all, it's up to you now, Pete, Joyce. Hi, my name is Otis Peterswans, but here in America, I I am called Mr. Uh, Pete Petersons. My life began in 1934 on our family farm in Northern Latvia. Our village in Elkshani was about 10 miles from Estonian border. Throughout my childhood, I have heard it said that my mother only stopped working in the fields long enough to give birth to me. Two of our female apprentices prepared a tub of hot water and acted as midwives. I was the youngest of three children, joining my five-year-old brother, Modris, and my two-year-old sister, Yausma. My 32-year-old father, Voldemars, and 29-year-old mother, Vera, dedicated their lives to our family and our beautiful and productive piece of land. 
Growing up in a natural environment allowed me to enjoy my younger days in total freedom and harmony. I was a curious boy who always stayed active. I couldn't stand still. And whenever neighbors or visitors came to our farm, they usually found me on the run, watching me hurrying from the barn to the winding river or from the windmill to the birch tree groves. Running was as natural for me as breathing air. Having so many intriguing places in our fam family, I could run in any direction and go as far as I wanted, that's what I said. I would love to sprint down hill in the rain, feeling the cold air as raindrops hit my face. This is how I discovered new sights with my dog Rex besides me. Our farm was a paradise of diversity. We raised everything we needed to thrive. We grew wheat, sugar beets, potatoes, and orchard fruits, basically apples and cherries. We raised dairy cows, and we had 12 of them. Uh, we had chickens, pigs, and goats. And we had two horses to pull the plows and wagons, and we grew to feed the horses. The manure from the animals went back in the fields of fertilizers for the next season of crops. Nothing was wasted. We had no electricity, so we had to store our food in cold storage in the basement. I will never forget the taste of my mother's freshly baked bread and homemade butter. I loved watching her use the long wooden paddle to pull the steaming loaves from the kiln my father had built. It was often served with honey from our own bar and, and milk just brought from the other. I also like to read, my mother was the one who handled all the bees. <laughs> <laughs> I will never forget that faithful day in late 1943, with autumn days getting shorter and cold air nipping at my face. The first of the autumn storms began with rumbles of thunder and rain beating against the windows and chilly winds whistling through the trees, shedding their leaves, covering the ground with blanket of yellow, orange, and red leaves, announcing the end of summer with cooler days ahead. It, wouldn't be, it won't be long before the first signs of snow blanketing the countryside. The peaceful Late fall afternoon was suddenly interrupted by terrifying sounds of Russian tanks rumbling closer and closer to our farm. It sent shivers through our bodies, our hopes slowly shattered. We had no prior warning since we had no radio or newspaper to warn us of the arrival of the Russian tanks and planes. It was decision time. Should they risk remaining in our home or and hope for the best under savage and oppressive Russian rule, or forever leave our dearly beloved land and escape to an uncertain freedom. In the end, our quest for freedom outweighed the chances of living under a harsh Russian rule and losing everything we had worked for. We made the decision to leave our beautiful farm we love so much. The Russians were advancing, getting closer with each hour. The ground trembled, sending birds flying in all directions. It was becoming more urgent to make this move or perish. We only had a few hours to gather our belongings, so we chose the most important and vital things for survival, including jewelry, warm clothes, smoke fans, dried fruit, and alcohol. We packed everything we could carry on a horse-drawn carriage. For the most difficult, my most painful decision was leaving behind my beloved dog, Rex. He sensed that we would be parting, perhaps never to be reunited again. He took, it took the life out of my of both of us. My saddest memory is that of Rex following our carriage until he realized he could not join us. The very last painful glimpse of Rex lying on the ground with his head tucked between his legs, still haunts me. Our goal was to reach the seaport of Liepaya, hoping to find a boat that would take us to a safe country. 
Realizing that the advancing Russians were not far behind, we spent the first night in the woods. We're, we were awakened the next morning by loud cannon fire of the Russians, giving us the best idea how close they had advanced toward us. After a few days, we were joined on this journey by many other Latvian families. We had become easy targets for Russian fighter planes, appearing suddenly from the clouds to strafe the roads filled with fleeing Latvians. When we spotted the Russian planes heading straight at us with guns firing continuously, we ran for cover in ditches or behind the nearby trees. Their planes returned again and again, continuing to make their sleek dives, heading directly at us. Our hearts continued to stop, sending chills down our backs. We will never forget how close we came to a tragic ending. We were on all unwilling witnesses to these all out air battles with numerous planes trailing smoke and twisting as they plunged through the air. Roads became clogged with dead horses, broken down carriages, and overturned wagons. Families who lost their wagons gathered their most important belongings and continued their escape on foot. They carried whatever belongings they still had, knowing how important they had for their survival. The lines extended to the horizon, an endless procession of sad faces and spent bodies. Children cried hysterically while clinging to their parents. Sometimes we were so exhausted, losing our will to finish our journey. We were lucky to survive close calls on the road, often getting help from total strangers. We were thankful for the friendly farmers who provided us with food and shelter. We admired their courage and determination to remain in their mother country, knowing that they too may eventually lose everything. Realizing we were getting closer to Liepaja energized us to finish our journey. We were so lucky to survive. After nearly two weeks of evading the advancing Russians, we finally arrived in Liepaja on the Baltic Sea. Hey, you're doing a pretty good job pronouncing <laughs> Latvian names. <laughs> My father spent two days in a futile search for a ship that would take our family to a safe port. He begged several captains to let our family board their ships, but they all refused. The captains informed my father that it was still not safe to leave Lepaya because Russian submarines were sinking ships as they sailed from the harbor. My father heard of one ship captain who visited Latvian ports and respected Latvian people. This captain provided our last chance for escape. My father anticipated that he might need some little bargaining leverage, so he brought some bottles of vodka to entice the captain to reconsider. Wartime shortages had made alcohol valuable community, community, and my father offered to convince the captain of a cargo ship heading to German port of dancing to let us board. The vodka turned out to be our lifesavers since this was the last ship to leave Liepaja, Latvia that day. As we were leaving, Russian planes attacked the harbor and left the city in flames. The captain was able to evade a Russian submarine that was chasing existing ships and we arrived in that dancing the next morning. We had escaped Latvia. We had very many mixed feelings. We were haunted by guilt for abandoning our homeland, and we felt relief was where we were gaining our freedom. The dark and cold of Danzig did little to elevate our spirits. We were pinned, pin, pinning our hopes on a new life in a country where we knew no one didn't understand language. We had given up everything we were familiar with in order to escape Latvia. We felt that we would probably never again be able to see our beloved homeland. It was difficult to overcome our feelings of helplessness. We were now refugees at the mercy of strangers. Because of unexpected hordes of Eastern Europeans attempting to escape Russia forces, the Germans had set up makeshift camps wherever there was space. Our lodging was in an abandoned big building. 
Life in the refugee camp was virtual hell, but at least we were alive. We depended on bringing supplies of food the Germans were able to provide. I became ill with Russian typhoid fever, which my cardiologist diagnosed as the origin of my current heart problems. If my father hadn't carried me on his back to a local hospital, I likely would not have made it in the camp. My survival during that period can be attributed to my father exchanging some of the amber that we had salvaged from our farm. Western relief organizations were setting up refugee camps and attempting to find Western countries that would be willing to accept Eastern European refugees. We never knew how long we would stay in a camp. We were always prepared for a hasty exit. We were aware of the fact that the DP camps were temporary with the deadline for closing all camps set for 1949. If we could not find a sponsor in another country or find a home in Germany, we would be sent back to Latvia or Russia, which would be essentially the same thing. If we were sent back to Latvia, we could end up as common laborers on the farm we once owned. We all had to overcome many barriers in our attempts to find countries that would accept refugees. Britain, for example, accepted only single men who would agree to work in coal mines. Canada accepted young and middle-aged women who would work in households, whereas Australia wanted entire families, including children. The United States required a sponsor who would agree to take whole families and who would be willing to look after them until they could survive on their own. We hoped to go to the United States. However, we didn't expect to spend five years moving between various camps before a sponsor could be found. In 1949, we received notice that a farmer from the state of Washington, Mr. Brodahl, with the help of the Lutheran Church, had agreed to sponsor our family. It was truly a glorious moment when we received documents for departure to the United States. We traveled first to the seaport of Bremenhaven, where we would be processed for passage on a refugee ship sailing for New York. As we waited for board our ship, we joined a long line of refugees from Eastern Europe most of which were desperately clutching their possessions as they pushed each other and shouted strange languages. The decks were crowded with people of every age, class, and nationality. Majority had simply put whatever belongings they had in padded suitcases or cloth bags. The 11-day voyage across the Atlantic was difficult from the beginning. We were packed like sardines into small stalls, we all have to tolerate our nationalities, food smells, and body odors. Since most of the passengers were unaccustomed to the rough seas of the North Atlantic, many became seasick. The smell of vomit, urine, and feces permeated our living quarters. The small cuts, al along with the frequent fire and emergency drills, made it difficult to sleep. We were sometimes forced to go out on the deck during the coldest of gales. Many of us felt the after, after effects of the shots that we had already received before leaving Germany. Both of my arms were swollen, making it difficult to sleep. Just when we thought we were, voyage would never end, we received news that we were approaching New York. We knew it would be a matter of hours before we would catch our first glimpse of the Statue of Liberty. Our fellow passengers suddenly seen much friendlier conversations about illness and misery were replaced by prediction of health, prosperity, and new land. As we sailed into the harbor, people in front of the ship became excited, raising their hands and pointing to... Oops. Oops. Well, something. pointing something that was appearing through the fog. As a matter of fact, that man was so excited that he rose about everybody's shoulders. Uh, that's how much, you know, it meant to be in America. 
when the fog cleared, strangers were seen embracing, shaking hands, and striking up songs as we glided past Statue of Liberty. Some just started to support America. The skyline of New York City was awe-inspiring. The multicolored buildings stared down at us as we were uh, the tallest that we had ever seen. It was as if the dark, depressing black and white images of war ravaged Europe had suddenly become replaced by brilliant, brilliantly alive technical lands. Unlike previous refugees who first came into contact with America through Ellis Island and who had to endure a arduous and lengthy processing ritual, ours was a simple one day process. Although we couldn't read the signs, the, yeah. We couldn't read our tickets. We were told that we would be traveling by train to Washington. Our journey across America would traverse three different time zones and numerous states, all of which were just strange names on the map. We crossed countless bridges, followed by beautiful winding rivers, and made stops in the larger cities. Modus Yelsma and I made a game of counting the number of tunnels the train had to go through and guessing the time it would take to clear each one. We saw the, once we saw the beautiful snow of cone-shaped peaks in the distance, uh, meaning the Cascades, we were approaching the, yeah, the Cascade Range. And by this time we knew Seattle was somewhere on the other side. We were reaching the end of this journey. Even though we were exhausted from the long ride, we were elated to finally arrive in Seattle. This was the beginning of our next journey, so much unknown in this foreign place, full of promise and opportunity. We were grateful to depart the train and step into our new life. Makes me cry. <laughs> And that's the end of our story. Thank you, Pete. Tim? So um, Nancy asked if I would help to moderate the questions. And I would simply ask if, if someone would like to ask a question, just write in the chat your name. Uh, and then that will be the order in which uh, we'll go to people. I'd also like to. Uh, um, make use of uh, what sometimes moderators will call um, their um, part of the part of the advantage of being a moderator and throw out the first question if, if I could. Um, my question for you will be, so a little bit of context. When I and, and many people look at what's happening in Ukraine today, um, these are things that we thought were the experience of our grandparents, but not going to be part of the experience we would have in our own adulthood. And sad to say, we were wrong about that, optimistic about that. When you hear what's happening in Ukraine today, what parts of their experiences strike you as most similar to the experience that you had? Uh, the extreme cruelty of the uh, Russian soldiers. There's one example that I'll never forget. The Russian soldiers had approached the village and there was a mother with a child and they proceeded to take him away from her mother and dumped him in a big water hole. The, the boy screamed and finally uh, there was no more noise. So it, images like that can really relate how animalistic, not only in, individuals, but countries that actually applaud this kind of action. And one more, my other, image that I'll never forget. There was a young, looked like about a six-year-old boy, all wrapped up in, in coats. And he, I was wondering, as he was walking, is there anyone else he's going to join him? And he uh, turned around, looked left and right, turned around, and that's when the scene ended. Let me ask you a follow-up. Um, 
and it's it's I, I have no words to describe you know my my shock and sorrow at um at the at what you've witnessed and what undoubtedly still goes on in wartime today so let me just express um as best i can um some sense of compassion i think i and and we should should feel um there's a lot of things that governments can and should do and and there are many things they're trying to do right now um to to reduce the harms that are befalling the ukrainian people and maybe to to put an end to the current war but from the perspective of individuals from your experience when we as individuals think about what should we be doing to perhaps make a positive difference what comes to mind from your perspective what should we be thinking about what should we as individuals be be trying to do well i think first of all you have to educate yourself with exactly what is going on and then what what is it that you can do something about it to me uh putin it represents cancer. He's not only uh, hurting the Russian, he's not only hurting the Ukrainians in the most, most savage way, but he's also hurting the Russian people. And there are many, many wonderful people, as we know, who have actually, I know in sports, that how many of the Ukrainian athletes uh, actually did really well. And now, uh, they're suffering with the rest of the, the, you know, their people. So we have a, we have a question from uh, Amber. Amber, would you like to go ahead? I would, thank you. Um, Mr. Pete, I had you actually at Agora High School for uh, European history and econ. I'm Gloria Hilliard's daughter. Um, and I, I recall during European history so many years ago, you sharing slides of Latvia. And at 14, 15, um, very little struck me, but that really did stay with me. Um, so it's just really powerful and special to hear your full story now. Um, I am sure you shared more than slides, but that the visual is what I remember and hearing you speak today is just really powerful. So I just wanna thank you and for being such an excellent teacher. You uh, made it quite the impact, so thank you. And so nice to see you. Thank you, you as well. Nancy, you had something you wanted to, to ask. Nancy, I think you're on mute. Oh, the rules. <laughs> Uh, Pete, um, I was wondering what was most helpful to you when you arrived in Washington? Um, you've gone through a really difficult period of time in your life, and now you've arrived someplace where you are safe. Um, but what was most helpful to you by, from the people who sponsored you, the, the community you arrived in? Um, if, if it's not too personal, can you share that with us? Because many of us are part of a refugee team. Well, I was most surprised how extremely friendly and how understanding they were about a, a foreigner coming. And they uh, really made us welcome. And there, there was no individual who uh, wasn't friendly that. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it really is important for somebody that is just brand new, doesn't speak language, and instead of laughing or giggling, they come put an arm around you and then, you know, ask you some questions which you can understand. So it's the friendliest, and this is what's really missing in America. Today we just are so divided, and it's going to take a lot of understanding people to finally you know, join in, be one American. He was also 14 years old when he arrived in Washington State. So these are the memories of a 14 year old child. Uh, one incident that I forgot to mention, our, our sponsor was Mr. Brodal, a Norwegian, and he had a son in the United States Air Force. And uh, 
when we started talking about dates and years, uh, we found out that he was a pilot who was dropping bombs. And he was dropping bombs on the big city of Hamburg, where my family were actually stuck in Hamburg. So the, what an irony, now, because we were late, we were waiting to get out of Hamburg to go down south to where eventually ended up being in a British American zone. Pete, what kind of physical support did they give you when you arrived in Washington? Did they provide you a home or what, what was it they were able to provide for you? Well, the agreement was that they would help us until we were able to be on our own. So uh, we really enjoyed the They even had a dog similar to Rex. And my dad and I <laughs> sometimes ended up laughing when he had, he learned how to drive the Jeep to bring the milk can, cans of milk to the delivery to be picked up. Well, one time, instead of pushing the brake, he hit the <laughs> accelerator and hit the piano, kind of big aluminum kind of milk shooting straight up. So welcome to America. <laughs> He, he lived with oh. Mr. Brodolph, right? Yeah. Your, your whole family, five yeah. of them. Right. And he had lost his wife, but he had he had a, a, a enough room for all of us. Yeah. Nancy, any? It, no, well, I just, well my, on. my dad was helping. And then, of course, all of my mother was helping cook. And, and so it was a, a mutual kind of a thing. And he was very happy that we could continue on which was going to Eastern Europe for a while, then coming back to Seattle. So is, did you go to school there when you were in Washington then? Oh, yes. And I was having fun trying to assimilate. But you know what? Everyone supported me because I was, as you can see, I'm a happy guy happy-go-lucky guy, and I smile more than frown. And my, uh, my fellow classmates sometimes would put me in a difficult position. And so one of them asked the teacher, why don't you have uh, Otis here tell us something about uh, war? So I said, General Rommel, he was a he fought on in the desert, <laughs> not desert. So everybody pointed fingers, but they laughed and they patted me on the back. So that was my welcome. <laughs> Nancy, anything else? I don't want to um, see if somebody else has something they'd like to ask. OK, we'll come back to you. Kathy Lope okay. has something to ask. I actually, uh, Mr. Pete, it was very similar to what Nancy was asking. I was um, so impressed with your uh, vivid recount of what happened to your family coming, uh, getting out of Latvia and coming over here. And I, I, as well as Nancy and others, were really wanting to hear what what it was like for you once you did get to Washington and how you were received what the reception was like and how you how you felt. Well, we were actually uh, in, Mr. Brunel, in your uh, uh, new home, and it's just fascinating and um, so interesting. And I, I'm I'm very impressed with with your story. And I I'm um, thinking constantly and hearing. Well, Mr. Brunel was a Lutheran. So actually, it was with, along with the, the Lutheran Church that we were sponsored. And so uh, we attended the services not far from our home where we lived. And again, uh, what really struck me was uh, when it came time for the services, and then afterwards, everybody brought uh, pies and cakes. I couldn't believe it. 
So I didn't <laughs> mind going to church. Um, we were, uh, our church and others in the area, uh, I'm sure you maybe have heard of the refugee uh, group that uh, Chris and Kitty and then Nancy was referring to have been part of. And uh, we dropped off bags of um, items to help the new refugees coming over yesterday. Oh, that's at the Islamic Center. It's very heartwarming to see the turnout of people um, that came to uh, either bring items, household items, or actually help put these welcome baskets together. So um, anyway, I just thought I'd let everyone know that it was it was really good to see people coming together to help others in that way. Because you're right. I think so much, uh, there's such division in our country right now. And um, basically, you know, we are all one. And, and um, when we have opportunities to help one another, um, especially people escaping such horrors that you, as you did, um, I'm, I'm encouraged to see people come together. Well, I think when, when you watch TV news and, and there are so many uh, drives by people uh, to help collect different items and there was no shortage. Matter of fact, they need more trucks to haul them around. So uh, that really shows down deep inside, I think we do care for other people. Kathy, anything, any follow up? Uh, no, other than that, I think it'd be interesting to know how the Petersons came to Southern California. <laughs> well, Mr. Brodal, as I said, he's a Norwegian and he even had a wonderful accent still after living 50 years in America. Uh, but what, what this showed that he took a chance not knowing what kind of family we were and it ended up as such a mutually wonderful thing. Uh, what I remember about Ferndale is a small town about five miles from Canadian border. And there was this uh, bay called Birch Bay. And we loved to go there because it probably would be uh, half a mile and you could walk just one foot deep water and then watch the fishermen. And that, that's, that one I'll remember for a long time. You asked about how we got together. Um, Mr. P graduated from USC and I graduated from UCLA. Oh, no. And um, we met uh, teaching in our first job. And uh, I, he used to come, I taught music and I taught choirs and he would come and take pictures of me and the children, with their beautiful faces as they were singing songs. And then the kids would bring the pictures to me the next day. And, I figured I had to find out who this Mr. Pete was. So I went and met him and the story. What a, what a sneaky way to get to know somebody. 58 <laughs> years ago. We've been married 58 years ago. I think Pastor Walt has a question or a comment, and then I'll go to Chris. Well, Otis, I, I was um, impressed by your good spirit. Um, your positive attitude as you reflect upon your difficult experience. And so I was wondering how, what, what you might attribute that to. It sounds as if you could by rights be a very angry, um, a very angry person, a, a, a person who felt very, um, scarred and injured because of the experiences you went through, yet it sounds like you've turned that to a positive. So I, I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about that, of how you found your way to that kind of good mental health or good spiritual health. Well, I think they're all starts with life in, in, a, in a farm 
where uh, parents are so supportive. We had so much fun uh, on farm. We played so many games. But one of the things that I'd like to, I learned how to catch a muscalangi fish, which is a big fish in Michigan. And I learned how to uh, approach the fish from behind while it was taking a, a mid-morning mid nap. And I would grab the fish and throw them on the floor and uh, Rex would end up laughing. And I learned also how to make a flute. It was a neighbor who came over and he said, hey, you wanna learn how to make a flute? And sure enough, eventually I did it the hard way. And I, I had so many very beautiful experiences that made me very, you know, as Americans say, you're a happy camper here. <laughs> so, uh, and I see, I, I, I feel so badly when people are angry at each other or countries are at each other. And it, there is, it just, it's the one, one aim for all, everybody, you know, to achieve nations, countries. And that's the kind of man he is. I have to say in all the years, we've never had an argument. He's happy and I try to be happy with him and we keep it that way. And, and by the way, my daughter, Marnie and Corey, the other daughter, they are such delightful children. And we are so happy that they are doing well in America. Pastor Walt, do you have a follow up? Chris. Uh, thank you, Pete. What a wonderful and very powerful story that um, unfortunately uh, people are reliving today and hopefully will um, receive uh, positive um, support from the co countries that they end up migrating to and hope, and especially in our country, we hope all refugees are welcomed. But we remember that Christ said, uh, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink and I was a stranger and you welcomed me. But our church does have a history of working and helping refugees. And we were one of the founders uh, about seven years ago of the Caneo Interfaith Refugee Team that Kathy and Nancy referred to. And this has many uh, active participants from our church, but from all variety of faiths through our community, Lutheran, Catholic, Jewish, Episcopal, Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, non-denominational Christians, and more. Um, we do a variety of things, and one is help deliver furniture. And yesterday, our, one of our delivery teams delivered to an Afghan refugee family resettling in Canoga Park. And uh, we often supply furniture, uh, bicycles, toys, TVs, uh, uh, Chromebooks, uh, working on getting cars. And then as Kathy mentioned yesterday, many of you helped participate in the, the refugee team effort with the Women's Interfaith Network of uh, collecting and assembling welcome kits. Over 150, I'm told, welcome kits were, were completed, which consisted of kitchen supplies or cleaning supplies and others. So I really want to appreciate all of those who participated and uh, thank our church. Um, I want to invite you to a program that's upcoming. That's, let's see in our announcements, May 26th, we are co-sponsoring with the Simi Valley Interfaith Council at the Latter-day Saints Church on Erringer Road in Simi. And it's entitled, Draw the Circle Wide, Understanding is the First Step in Loving. And how do we be good neighbors to the new refugees in our community? And there will be a speaker, one of the speakers will be a refugee from Afghanistan who has been living in, in, in Simi now and, and succeeding. So uh, there will be other um, educational and action opportunities coming up. So stay tuned with the announcements. Uh, 
And um, again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pete, and for coming and, and sharing with us an important part of your life and that and helping educate us the need for us to be involved in, in welcoming people from other countries and, and other cultures. So thank you again. Uh, and Nancy? Nancy, I think you're on mute. I'm a rule follower. Um, Tim, did you have any other questions you wanted to ask before we move on? I think I've um, heard great questions and comments and great responses. I'd also like to um, share my thanks to, to you, Pete, and you, Joyce, for sharing your time and your thoughts. You, you've given us sort of an intimate look at um, your experiences in your lives. And I know that that's, that's precious to us um, as well as something you deeply feel. It helps us to understand. I think, Nancy, we have a few more minutes if anybody else has a question they want to ask. Is that right? Yes, we do have a little bit more time, absolutely, in case somebody wanted to ask a question or make a comment. So let me just pose it to the to those assembled. If anybody would like to ask something, just put raise a hand in Zoom, raise a Zoom hand, and uh, we'll call on you next. Can oh, I ask Kathy Lo Kathy Lopez. Kathy, you're on mute. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank uh, those of you that put this together. And um, I think the Petersons are, um, it, it's just um, wonderful to hear your stories and also to realize the, um, the impact of um, refugees, people from coming from other countries with various backgrounds and how you've added to the fabric of our country. That's what I was going to follow up with is, Pete, can you tell them a little bit about the influence you've had on so many people, not just as a teacher, but um, in your, uh, Pete is an amazing athlete, and he has shared that knowledge with other people. And can you tell them just a little bit about the opportunities you've had in America uh, being, you know, the, when it comes to track and field, or are you uncomfortable sharing that? kind of? Oh, no. I think uh, I'm also both fortunate and also lucky. I meet people who end up being such good friends and who also lend a hand. One of my teammates at USC was Bob Lawson. He uh, is from actually state of Washington. And he introduced me to the head coach of SC, and he was uh, saying that Pete's a pretty good runner. Why don't you give him a chance? And I was so surprised because I was not a great high school runner. And, and yet there was Bob, after I received the news that he was, I was going to get the scholarship, he lifted me up. <laughs> and said, now, don't you let me down. So that, that's what, every time I ran a race, I was looking at Bob and make sure that he approves what I was running, run, doing. Well, um, the other thing you did is you began to teach uh, other people good running technique and skills. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I'm actually a product of nature. And you know, when you're, uh, I think if you want to look at what nature's done, done, but watch young little kids or young children in playground. Watch how exuberant they are. Nobody's telling them, nobody's uh, threatening them, and yet they are doing. So that's what my philosophy is, run for fun. And from fun will come the re results. So not only were you um, a teacher, but you were, um, you really influenced a lot of people. That's what I'm trying to say. When Kathy brought up the, how the gifts that immigrants have brought to our country, you're one of those people I think of. Um, you took your gifts and graces and you shared them and really 
important ways. And you heard what Amber said about you and um, how, what an impact you made on her when she was in high school. So um, I, I think that's really important for us to think about is we're welcoming people who are immigrants that they're gonna bring something to our country that we didn't have before. Um, they're gonna be here contributing something important. And you're a perfect example of that. And I really appreciate that you, that my daughter, our daughters had a chance to experience, but there were hundreds of students and athletes who have profited from both your um, uh, sharing of your, your talent, as well as Joyce and the way she gifted people at the uh, high school and uh, encouraged them to do their best. And I, I'm sure that's just a remarkable gift to give to, to your community and to your country. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And I feel so welcome here in this community. As, as a matter of fact, Joyce, how many years have we lived in this community? Oh, in this house, we've been 50 years. Yeah. 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 So Can you of, get, a lot of go on. Yeah, I was gonna say, Pete's done a lot of coaching with uh, local kids as well as world-class athletes. Um, he has a couple of uh, Olympic gold medals in, in his coaching history and kids who have traveled with him around the world competing in track and field events in countries all around the world and bringing American spirit and Pete spirit and the spirit of, of um, fellowship and, and camaraderie around the world with track and field. And I was very fortunate to work with a guy named Bill Toomey, who was having troubles with his running. And uh, he actually moved to Santa Barbara that one year when he was there. And he came in and I noticed that he was so tense and so trying so hard. And I finally got him to relax more. In other words, to train not all out speeds always, and it, it improved. As a matter of fact, he won the, the most difficult decathlon in Mexico City, where it took 12 hours, two days of five events each day. And afterwards, Bill was chosen to be the rep, uh, American representative to the Munich Olympics. And he went to different countries, and he always talked about you know, uh, a coach who can benefit you, not necessarily pure, pure technical, but also the emotional. And again, let's go back to the word natural. There's a natural way of running and there's a way of straining. There goes Coach Pete again. <laughs> mm. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Any, any last... Um questions or comments before we turn it back to Nancy to um, and Pastor Walt to close out. I'd like to know if Donna's going to feed us. <laughs> You're on mute, Donna. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think Wayne has something to add. I see. I thought I wasn't visible. I wanted to hear every minute, but I had a time commitment. And so I'm fixing a quiche as you're, as I'm being inspired. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, you had something to add. You're okay. Uh, am I okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have, um, yeah. I'm really puzzled how a Bruin and a Trojan live in the same house and never have an argument. I need to know how that works. Oh, it's uh, it, it's a strange because Joyce is a unbelievable um, UCLA fan, and I'm I, I'm a, I'm an SC fan, but not anywhere near where Joyce. She has she puts on the blue shirts on on the game day, and she sings along the songs. <laughs> so we. Uh, we let's say that's right. We don't talk as much that on that day. <laughs> <laughs> that's no arguments. You don't Mark, have, you can't argue. 
<laughs> That's cute. Is Marnie still there with you? Yeah. Right so, here. So here's Marnie, their daughter, one of their oldest daughter, and she really has been so helpful in making this happen today. She and I have been communicating and she's been practicing with Pete and helping them get ready for our uh, presentation. So Marnie, kudos to you. I know you've always done this. This has been something that's, you know, you, I've watched you with your parents over the years, but we really appreciate all you did to make this possible for us today. So I just wanted you to see, see Marnie and be able to give her a little thank you. All right, Marnie. Nancy, we have one more from uh, Nadine Larson and the folks assembled with her. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Oh, that was me. Um, I wanted to introduce myself to you, Pete. Um, I talked to your wife this morning in choir. My daughter was in the Peace Corps in Latvia for two years from 96 to 98. And I was fortunate enough to go visit her there. So I did you see her? We couldn't connect right away. Did you see Lori's? connection here at all okay so uh where will we find out um how we can watch this now so i can let her know too because she's most anxious to to hear this Pete, and to meet you one of these days um, have to ask nancy about that yes let's ask joanna about that because joanna is the one who makes all this pot that makes that possible can you talk can you tell us joanna uh yes so we will um, I, I will turn this over to Paul Fay, and just the recording start to finish will be available to people that couldn't make it today. Um, I think it'll take a couple days and then I'll send an announcement out for anyone that wants to uh, watch it um, start to finish. So we had we had several people that said they would be very interested in that. So especially some choir members who couldn't <laughs> be here today because they, they wanted to hear uh, Pete and Joyce's story. So, wonderful. Nancy, Shall I go? to you, yes. Okay, so um, Pastor Wall, can we count on you for a little blessing as soon as I finish? Okay, so I just, I thought there was one thing that Pete said that real, there were many things that he said, but one of the things he said is about um, understanding leading to loving other people and treating them well. and. I think that that's one of the things that um, the Canal Valley Interfaith Refugee Team has been working on in try as we interact with people. And uh, we see how Gary Evans, a uh, member of our church, has uh, formed long-term relationships with people from many countries over the last five or six years. And we see how all of our um, faith community, I think there are 12 different or 14 different churches working together on their interfaith red refugee team and I, I think one of the things we're hoping is that what you hear today will help you to understand not only what we're trying to accomplish and be want want to be a part of it but when you have the opportunity is to speak up and and to let other people know that um that you're a person who is opening your heart to refugees and I hope they will too well, we're all we're all yeah, what I was gonna say. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, that was great. Thank I you for that. Thank you for saying yes. And um I think your example of, of an open mind and an open heart um and a willingness to uh, share with others is really a good example for all of us. And that's what I was trying to say, but I got all caught up thinking about what I was saying and got a little emotional, so. <laughs> but they all know me enough to know that's where I have often end up. Well, what I like to end the saying is, my two daughters are just the most unbelievable human beings. I wouldn't be anywhere near the person without her. She helps me with uh, computers. She helps me so many ways. And of course, Corey is a different person. She loves horses. And so now she's actually working with the equine program at Malibu. And she too, uh, two wonderful human beings. Yes. Two wonderful parents. <laughs> <laughs>
Chris, do you have anything else to say or should we have our prayer and, and move on? I guess we're ready for the prayer. Thank you, Pastor Walt. All right, let's all uh, unite our spirits to be in prayer. Uh, we thank you, God, for the blessings of this day and for the special blessings that we have received from, from Pete and Joyce as they have shared their story uh, of resilience, of, of human resilience in the face of um, terrible oppression and dislocation. Um, we, we are touched by the, the sadness of what we humans do to one another. We are also touched by the, by the way we uh, seek to uplift one another and care for one another. And we, we see that in, in this story and we are encouraged uh, through this story to be people who uplift and help to be constructive and positive in people's lives uh, through various refugee programs that are offered to us now. So we would, we would pray for the refugee wherever he or she is now journeying on our globe. We would pray for uh, the dear souls who are opening their hearts and their, their homes to help settle the refugee and for the possibilities that are hidden and then blossom through um, this kind of acted out compassion that continues forward uh, the life and the new life of the refugee and the refugee family. May those families that are, that are touched in giving aid or receiving aid be a blessing to their communities and may they be blessed by you and their families. We ask special blessing upon the refugee program here in our community and especially upon uh, Pete and Joyce um, as they make their way. As, as a witness to the power of love and grace in our world. We pray this all in the hopes that there will be a better day. And may we be a part of making that happen. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. I hope that this, this was something that will, uh, you'll carry with you and that um, you'll give some thought to it in the days to come. Um, knowing that you can make a difference, how large or how small, we'll never know. But whatever you do to ease this situation um, and bring peace and joy to our world is a gift. And we thank you for that. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Pete, Joyce, Marnie, everyone who helped. Blessings, my friends. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. We love you. Love you. Thank we you. love you, too. Thank you, Tim. Bye, Joyce. Bye, Pete. See you bye. soon. Bye, everybody.